enter the minds of God's people during this time that we must guard against is judgment and even a condemnation of the people in the world who are caught up in these affairs. Of course, we are to be judging and discerning what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, and what is holy and what is profane. And we do this by holding things up against what we see in God's word. We do this in order to keep our feet moving in the right direction. The holidays that are kept by the world are for something that we look at and that we do try to avoid. But we do must be careful, we must be careful not to judge or condemn the people that are blinded to God's way of life at this time. We need to remember that one, judgment belongs to the Lord, and two, that the world is walking under the influence and under the sway of the devil. For today's message, I'd like to look at a group of people who were conceivably the worst of the worst in scripture. In part, these people represent the world at large under Satan's sway. As we look at the history of these people throughout scriptures and look at the references that were made about them, we will see how God dealt with them, and in doing so, we'll see parallels to the majority of mankind who do not know and have not had their chance to know God or his way. We will see what the physical end result is when people live in opposition to God and spiritually what will be in store for them in God's master plan. In one way, I guess it's my attempt to try and keep the feast fever going here amongst us. We'll do this by examining the ultimate fate of this group of people. Today, I'd like to look at the city of Sodom. Well, in looking at its inhabitants, as well as the references that are made throughout scripture. In doing this, we'll see a small sample of people, again, that represent the world under Satan and what their final outcome will be, again, both physically and spiritually. It was surprising to me that in researching Sodom that it's mentioned 53 times in the King James Version. The very first time we see Sodom mentioned in scripture is in Genesis 10 and verse 19. It's here that the boundaries of the lands of the descendants of Canaan are described. Canaan was the grandson of Noah and the son of Ham. In this section of Genesis 10, we read of the cities that made the boundaries of the Canaanite land. There was Sidon and Gerar, and then Sodom and Laisha. We know Sidon and Gerar are points along the Mediterranean Sea from north to south. Now, no one is sure exactly where Sodom was, or Laisha for that matter, but if these are the borders of Canaan, it's a good guess that Sodom and Laisha were the eastern corners of the territory. There are many clues in scripture, and many of the scholars seem to believe that Sodom was just south of the Dead Sea. The next time from Genesis 10 that we read about Sodom is Genesis 13. Let's turn there to Genesis 13, and we'll read just a little bit here. In this chapter, we find that Abram and his family are returning from Egypt, where he had traveled due to a famine in the land of Canaan. We see that Abram's time in Egypt paid off as he returns to the land of promise with great wealth and with many herds of animals. Both Lot and Abraham were blessed with prosperity, so much so that they had great numbers of livestock to the point that they had to actually separate because there was strife beginning to happen between the two parties. Abram offers Lot whatever land he wants. And let's pick up the story here in verse 10 of Genesis 13. Starting in verse 10 here, it says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. Here we see that Sodom, if located where the scholars think, was apparently at the far south end of the rich lands of the Jordan Valley. We know that the Dead Sea is at the south end of the Jordan Valley, and it's interesting that the two nicknames given to the Dead Sea are the Salt Sea and the Sea of Sodom. 
One fact we find about Sodom, along with its approximate location, was that the land was choice. As we read, it was like the Garden of Eden. It was also compared to the land of Egypt, no doubt, talking about the Nile Delta. In chapter 14 of Genesis, we can see this, that Sodom was its own territory and even had a king presiding over it. When Abram and his men rescued Lot and the other people from King Kedorla Amor, he met with King Bera of Sodom, who came out to meet Abram and to honor him for the victory. It's interesting that Abram refused to take anything from Sodom. In verse 23 of chapter 14, Abram said he made a promise to God that he wouldn't take anything so that Bera could not say that he made Abram rich. This may be simply Abram's recognition that it was God who won the battle for him. But perhaps there was something deeper in the meaning here. Perhaps the reputation of Sodom was something that was already known of by Abram. Also interesting, the name of Bera, the king of Sodom, means son of evil. Perhaps another clue is why Abram didn't want any part of his gifts. After this encounter, we don't hear about Sodom again until chapter 18 of Genesis. It's in chapter 18 that three men come to visit Abraham and Sarah. One of the three is the Lord, which we're told in verse 1. And just as an aside, we see that Abraham bows to them and is not told to stand up. The opposite was true in several instances in the Bible when men prostrated themselves to just angels and were told to immediately arise. Just another clue that it was the Lord here. After telling Abraham and Sarah that they would have their son of promise in their old age, we're told that the three men turn their attention to Sodom. Let's pick up the story here in Genesis 18, starting in verse 16. Genesis 18, and starting in verse 16. We read, Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And dropping down to verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. It's at this point that Abraham inquires of the Lord whether or not he would destroy Sodom if X number of people were righteous in the city. Well, we soon find out that there's not even 10 that are righteous. And then we come to chapter 19, where we find the story of the destruction of both Sodom and Gomorrah. One interesting side note when I was looking at this that I had never picked up on before was that we see in the beginning of chapter 19 that two men enter the city, the two angels. In the previous chapter, there were three that visited Abraham, like we said, one of whom was the Lord. You wonder if the Lord sent the two angels forward and then he took his place back on his throne to execute judgment on the people. Or perhaps the Lord was just not going to get that close to that kind of evil. We see in chapter 19 that God, that God does spare Lot and his two daughters and destroys the cities of the plain. The inhabitants of the, of the plain, all the crops that grew from the ground, and even the ground itself was destroyed. This was the end of this society and the end of this physical story of the people of Sodom. After reading of their history, there's one question that might come to mind, and that is, what were the sins of Sodom? Now, that might sound like a silly question. I mean, even the word Sodom evokes thoughts of heinous and sexually immoral sins. We read that the outcry against it was great and that the sin was very grievous or serious before the Lord. We can tell by the way the crowds acted against the two angels that they were very depraved and morally corrupt. We can tell this also by Lot's pleading with the angels to stay with him when they thought that they might just stay in the city all night. Again, there was an obvious and ob obscene level of immorality. But again, what brought them to this degree of depravity? If you would, let's turn to the prophet Ezekiel and let's hear what the words 
he had to speak that were given to him from the Lord concerning Sodom. It's in Ezekiel 16 that there's a prophecy about Jerusalem and how much God loved Judah like a husband loves a wife and how much more their iniquities were than that of Sodom. It's because they knew God and God had done so much for them. In this comparison with Sodom, we see an important piece of information about what was behind all of their wickedness. Let's begin here in verse, verse 44, and we'll read through verse 50. Verse 44 of Ezekiel 16, we read, Indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you, like mother, like daughter. You are your mother's daughter, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. Your elder sister is Samaria, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you, and your younger sister who dwells to the south of you is Sodom and her daughters. You did not walk in their ways nor act according to their abominations, but if that were too little, you became more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, says the Lord, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. And let's notice verse 49. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Here from God's own lips, we see a description of why Sodom came to an end. The first and most attributing factor that perhaps we don't often think of when we think of Sodom is, and it's what brought them to their destruction, it was pride. We understand that pride is the lifting up of oneself, a self-exaltation and arrogance. It's usually coupled with an unthankful attitude expressed toward God. We see from verse 49 what contributed to their pride. First, they had fullness of food. We read earlier that the land was, was like the Garden of Eden, a land that Lot chose maybe in a split second when Abraham gave him the choice. A fertile and well-watered land in the valley supplied the right elements of abundant crops. Secondly, we're told they had an abundance of idleness. Now, I had, had an opinion of what this meant, but when I looked it up, it actually means peace and security. Perhaps Abraham, after defeating the four kings that came out against Sodom in chapter 14, they had no more enemies to face. This may have resulted in a time of peace that Sodom never experienced before. God commanded Israel when they came into the promised land and conquered the people and had peace and abundance to not become prideful. Perhaps the example of Sodom was on the Lord's mind. Regardless, God understands the nature of men and the influence of the adversary. How when things are going well and there's no problems around, that could be the most dangerous of times. God warned how pride can lead to a blindness to the very one who makes all of these blessings possible. Let's go to Deuteronomy 8 and let's read this warning to Israel and see, that, see how that in part this may have played out with the people of Sodom. Deuteronomy 8, and we'll read verses 11 through 14. Deuteronomy 8, and starting in verse 11. We see, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful homes and dwell in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. When we read the phrase, your heart is lifted up, we know what is being discussed. My Bible has an alternate translation in the reference margin that says, you get to be proud. Sodom was not a people like Israel who were called to be an example, but it does go to show us that when peace and prosperity in this world 
happens, it can lead to pride when men live outside of God's law. Sodom, in their peace and security and in their abundance, not only became prideful, they became selfish. We're told that they didn't look to the needs of others who were less fortunate among them. Throughout his word, God places a special importance on taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. Even worse, along with pride and selfishness, there was a haughty attitude. They, were, they weren't just being prideful, but they were being blatantly and disdainfully prideful. And it appears from verse 50 and from what we can surmise the way Lot reacted with the two angels that the people of Sodom were haughty. They were blatantly prideful with their sinning and abominations before God. I've mentioned this before in a message, but it's something that always comes to my mind when I read the word abomination. In the Hebrew, it means something that is disgusting to the Lord. Truly what was going on in Sodom, and maybe even worse, how it was going on in Sodom was with haughtiness, was something that was disgusting to God. So here we see pride and haughtiness was the crux of the issue before Sodom. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 16 and verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. These words prove never more true than in the case of Sodom. The end of verse 50 here in Ezekiel 16 shows us the absolute power and the judgment of our God. He said that he took Sodom away as he saw fit. So brethren, this has been just a short history of Sodom. The remaining references to Sodom in the Old Testament describe how those who are evil or who resemble the same types of evil that were done in Sodom will have the same fate as Sodom. Some of those who are referenced to be like Sodom or becoming as Sodom are the people of Ammon, Moab, Babylon, even Judah and Israel, including the city of Jerusalem, and any of God's people who turn from him to follow other gods. These, as scriptures say, will be likened unto Sodom. For the remaining part of the time that we have, let's look at some of the parallels to Sodom in our world today and the lessons that we could learn from these parallels. Some of these probably came to our mind as we were looking at the history of Sodom, but it does serve as a warning to us. And it shows that God rules justly and the same with all people, regardless of their times of calling. The first lesson that we can take away from Sodom is that God will only allow things to go so far before he becomes involved. So the first parallel, God will only allow things to go so far before he becomes involved. In Romans chapter 1, we're told three times that because of the wickedness of men and their turning away from their creator, that he, quote, gave them over to uncleanness, vile passions, and a debased mind. We see in that chapter a description of how people become when they're given over to this type of attitude, and it reads as an almost direct parallel to Sodom. Although God has given man over to their own imaginations, it seems when things go too far, or if the actions of men will alter his plan for all of mankind, he directly gets involved. We could see this in the story of the flood in Genesis 6, and when the people rebelled at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. In the latter account, we see that the Lord came down to see firsthand what was happening at Babel, and he ended up confusing the languages of the people. And we saw it again with Sodom. We know from Job that the angels apparently report to God in his throne room. And although we know God is all-knowing, it's almost as if in some situations God says, I need to see this for myself. It's something I didn't even imagine happening. Now this is just my own speculation, but I say this because of what we read earlier in Genesis 18 and verse 21. Again, that said, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. God gives mankind free moral agency, but no matter what he decides to do with that, God's plan will never go awry. God is like a master chess player 
who will never lose the game regardless of the moves that men make. His plan will come to fruition and his will will be done. This parallel with the situation of Sodom is that, is that there is a similar thing that will happen to the world on a grander scale. Just as the outcry was so great and evil that, it took, that took place in the city, the world at the end time will be so evil that we're told in Romans 8 that the very creation will groan because of it, as well as God's people. We're told that the world will get so bad that it would end up destroying itself unless God intervenes, and he will. God again will come down to intervene in matters of men. This time it will not be to flood the earth or to confuse a language or to destroy a city, but it will be to put down all evil and to do it most convincingly. And notice it will leave the earth in a Sodom-like state. So again, God will only let things go so far before he executes his plan of love. To finish this point in making this parallel, let's turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 28 through 30. We'll see what Christ had to say about this. Luke 17, and starting in verse 28. We read, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The second parallel we can make from the situation of Sodom is this. God doesn't take his people out of the world Rather, he allows them to live in it with purpose. God doesn't take his people out of the world. He allows us to live in it with purpose. In the case of Lot, I have heard messages that showed how Lot progressively got closer and closer to the city of Sodom throughout time, and even perhaps became involved in the government of that city. This does seem to play itself out in scripture However, we're told something about Lot, who clearly knew the things that were happening in the land of Sodom, that shed some light on the type of person that Lot was. After the Genesis account of Sodom, we hear very little about Lot. The only thing we hear after the, after the destruction of the city and Lot escaping is that Israel, when leaving Egypt, was told not to claim any land from Ammon, as that land had been given to the descendants of Lot. But thousands of years later, we see both Christ and Peter make mention of Lot. Let's see what Peter was inspired to write in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter 2, and we'll read verses 6 through 9. Verse 6 reads, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, conde condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Here a lot is called righteous. It's dikaios in the Greek. It was just, it means just, upright, and keeping the commands of God. It can also be surmised that Lot is called godly based on verse 9. We're told he was oppressed or vexed, meaning that he was mentally afflicted by the evil that was happening around him. He was tormented or distressed by it all. And we read that he was continually tormented by it. Lot's life can be seen as a parallel to ours. Christ prayed to the Father that he wouldn't take us out of the world, but that he would keep us from the evil one and the effects of the world around us. And although we are still surrounded by the evils of this world, Christ told his disciples that because you are called by God, you are no longer of this world. We're warned several times not to be mixed with the world, and never more so than in Revelation 18, 
I'll just read this. It's from verses 4 and 5, but it's familiar to us. It reads, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Much like the outcries of the righteous over the evils of this world reach the ears of God, the sins and the actions and the evil of this world are also not lost on God. <clears throat> I remember Mr. Greider used to use the example of us living in this world as a type of lifting weights or exercise. The trials and the testing that we face are meant to make us stronger. James tells us that the testing of our faith produces patience, that we, be, that we may be made perfect, lacking nothing. James also went on to say, quote, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Just as Lot's time in Sodom made it clear to him that he must leave, we too should see the ways of this world and want nothing of it. And this brings us to a third parallel. No matter how bad things are or will be, God will rescue his people. No matter how bad things are or how bad they will be, God will rescue his people. Later in Genesis 18, Abraham pleads with God and questions him about Sodom and about sparing it, like we had said. He asks if even if there were 10 righteous, would he spare the city? Of course, there were not 10, but only Lot's household. Nevertheless, God sent his angels to save him. This rescue of Lot and those of his family who would follow him is a direct parallel to us. This undoubtedly brings our minds to Revelation 7. And let's turn to this one in Revelation 7, reading verses 1 through 3. Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. We also read in chapter 12 of Revelation how at the end time, God will provide protection to his church for three and a half years. Brethren, the story of Lot can help us hope that, it can give us hope that if we are living justly with integrity and following the commandments of God, staying close to him, God by his grace will give us a way of escape from the troubles that will come on the earth. The Bible is full of stories of deliverance for the people of God, especially from what seemed to be the most extreme and hopeless situations. We could think of the Exodus, of David and Goliath, of Daniel and his friends. Truly, there's nothing too hard for God, and his plan includes deliverance of his people from this world. Brethren, in the beginning of this message, we said that we have to be careful not to judge the world or condemn them for the evil that we see widespread in society. We've seen what the end of Sodom was, and we read what the end of the world will be in Scripture. But we also know that God is not done with the people of Sodom, nor is he done with the people of this world once their physical fate is carried out. There is that eighth day of the feast, which we recently rehearsed, that pictures this. This leads to the fourth and final parallel that we can draw from Sodom. The fourth parallel, Sodom and those of this world who have never known God will be given a chance at eternal life. Sodom and the world will have their chance at eternal life. Sodom is mentioned 10 times in the New Testament, five of which are from Christ, when he tells of a future time of judgment that we know as the second resurrection. Let's look at one of these references in Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11, and we'll read verses 23 and 24. We may have heard this at the feast. I think we did in Ireland. 
Matthew 11, verse 23. Christ speaking and saying, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you and have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Here we see that as bad as Sodom was, their judgment period will be more tolerable than the cities of Christ that he had preached to. From this statement, we understand that this judgment is not a judgment to condemnation, to eternal death for Sodom, or else how could it be considered more tolerable? When the righteous judge stands in session, we're told that those who, had, who Christ had preached to and saw his mighty works performed would have, have a harder time. Their time will be harder because they will come to the realization that it was God in the flesh who was among them and trying to help them. Sodom will no doubt give an account of their actions as well, but they will be given the same chance at repentance and learning God's way of life, just as we have had in this life and as the whole world will have when their time comes. No doubt they will remember what the outcome of a life apart from God resulted in. Perhaps that will make them all the more ambitious to get it right when their opportunity comes. The same will be true for all people. The people of Ammon and Moab, Babylon, Judah, Israel, they were all likened to Sodom in the physical life. They will be likened to Sodom in the day of judgment as well. The books will be open for all people, and they will see a stark contrast from the way they live their lives to what they see in God's word. They will see those of Sodom and realize that they too have a life, a new life, with a potential to become spirit-born children of God. Won't it be amazing for the people of Capernaum to come to the realization of who Christ was and is? Or perhaps the people of Sodom to see Lot as a first fruit? And perhaps the people who live amongst us every day to see us as spirit beings. Brethren, the story of Sodom has many parallels to the world at large. Today we only looked at some briefly. We must remember as bad as the world is and will become, God has everything in control and he knows when to step in. His plan will come to fruition regardless of the actions of men. We also know that as we see the world getting worse and worse, we are in our time of training. We must keep up the faith, the fight of faith and not get drawn into the ways of the world. Let's also remember to take heed to the warnings we read in scripture to stay close to God, to keep ourselves from the deeds of the world so that we like Lot when the time comes will be given our way of escape. Finally, let's remember as much as it vexes us to see the things going on in the world, the people of this world will one day have their time to know God and receive an opportunity at life. For us, let's continue our fight now so that we can be there to help all of them, including Sodom, when the time comes. Thank you, Mr. McTurnan. Brethren, let's rise again and turn to hymn number 107. Blessed and happy is he, hymn number 107. 